1, Jonah chapter 1, we're going to read the first three verses. We may jump around, in fact we will, if you want to join with me, that's just fine. Jonah 1, 1 to 3. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. <clears throat> In 1945, three young men literally came out of nowhere and they ended up being, you can say, the leading names amongst well-known evangelists. All three of them were in their mid-twenties. I want you to think about that. Mid-twenties. They were immensely gifted men. There was an anointing of God that rested upon every single one of these men. And these three men were Chuck Templeton, Bron Clifford, and Billy Graham. Chuck Templeton, Bron Clifford, and Billy Graham. Now, I have no doubt in this building, many, many of us know who Billy Graham is. We, we have, we are not, we are not, we are not, this man is not a, a, a mystery to us. This man is not somebody we are not aware of. Right, Billy Graham is the world's greatest evangelist that ever lived. Nobody has topped Billy Graham, and nobody may ever do. I don't know, right? But as as it stands right now, he's the greatest evangelist this world has ever known. So how come we have not heard of Chuck Templeton, or how come we have never heard of Bron Clifford? Well, five years after this, Chuck Templeton left the ministry. He became bitter. He became faithless. He no longer believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and began to pursue a career in television, radio, and, 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 and um, uh, uh, commentary and became a, a newspaper columnist. And to call a long story short, as time went by, this man ended up sadly dying of Alzheimer's disease. Bron Clifford, nine years later, he's divorced. He lost his family. He lost his ministry, he lost his health, and eventually his life because alcohol and financial irresponsibility destroyed him. At the age of 35, he dies in a cheap hotel at the edge of somewhere called Amarillo in Texas. Now, I want you to think about this this morning, church. Here are three men who have been called by God. Three men. God has called them. God has called them. God has called them, three men, but two of them dropped the call. I want to preach to someone I've called a dropped call this morning. And it's so important, church, that you and I do not drop the call. <laughs> Jonah 1, 1 to 3. <clears throat> Amen. The Bible says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son I saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Father, this morning, we are grateful, God, for your call. We are grateful, God, for your hand upon our lives. Mighty God, that you would love us so much that you would deal with us. I'm asking right now, God, this morning, God, you would minister to your precious people, God, that I hear this morning, God. Men and women, you have called by name and they are yours. I'm asking God this morning for anyone who's lost. Father, they would not reject the call. I'm asking God for the people of God. Father, as you continue to bring us to a place of Christ-likeness, we would not reject the call. I'm praying, God, for those who are religious, God, who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of, oh God, let them too not reject the call. I'm praying for myself, mighty God, as you continue to deal with me, God, that I myself will not reject your call. Father, we give you the glory this morning for all you're going to do 
And Father, we thank you right now, God, for the supernatural transformation that is about to happen. We give you all the thanks in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus Christ, uh, and all of God's people who said, uh, amen and, and amen. I want to look, first of all, this morning at the call of God, the call of God. Now, many of us are very familiar with the story of Jonah. Even those who are not saved are familiar with the story of Jonah. When you talk to people about Jonah, whether they be Christian or non-Christians, what comes to mind is the great fish. People think it was a big whale that ended up swallowing Jonah. The truth is we don't know. We're just told that it is a great fish that swallowed this man. But the story of Jonah is far much more than a fish that swallowed a man. The story of Jonah is about a man who is on the run this morning. I wonder this morning whether you've ever had a situation huh, where you're talking to somebody on one of these one of these boys. You talk to somebody on this you know, on the phone, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, it just the phone just goes off. All of a sudden, uh, uh, it's, it, you're having a great conversation, and all of a sudden, it just uh, abruptly ends without a warning. And when that happens, uh, there is a term or there is a name for that. It is called a dropped call. Now, a dropped call can be frustrating for several reasons. Number one, it, it could be frustrating when you're having a conversation with somebody and the conversation you're having is important. There's something vital that has been shared or that's been communicated and all of a sudden there's dropped calls or maybe you're about to make a, an important point or they're about to tell you something important. All of a sudden there's dropped calls and it is frustrating. What, the other weird thing about the drop caller is that sometimes it could be seen as a blessing because the person on the other line, you don't want to be talking to them. And finally, the drop calls, and all of a sudden, you say, "Hey, praise God! God's answered my prayer." Because I didn't want to, I don't want to talk to this person. And all of a sudden, they dropped her, and it breaks, and you're unable to speak to that person. Now, let me tell you something: a drop call this morning is not something that happens purposeful. In other words, you are not hanging up on the person, and the person is not hanging up on you. A drop call is because, uh, amen, of something geographical. And when it happens this morning, uh, one of the two parties, uh, what it is, they're in something called a dead zone. Uh, and when you are in a dead zone there is poor service you are in a bad area it is a place where there is now poor service and we usually know where these dead zones are when we drive maybe through a tunnel amen a long tunnel all of a sudden you know that that phone is going to cut off and maybe you tell the person listen i'm about to go through a tunnel I'm a, the phone may cut off because you know but that going through this you're going through a dead zone and the end of result will be a drop call it could be in your house where you live it could be uh, at work there's somewhere the area in the work where you can't seem to receive uh, the, the the conversation properly it could be in the coldest sack like this believe it or not this area where we are where we have our building is a dead zone that you can't do the reception is not very good as you're talking to somebody and their voice is kind of cutting in cutting out uh, and it could just easily uh, uh, just cut off uh, and what happens church uh, again we know where this dropper uh, these dead zones are uh, and it happens when both parties uh, are not close enough to the tower it is the tower that provides uh, the connection and when there is no and when there is not a close proximity with the tower we lose uh, the connection uh, with the call the physical truth of this is also true spiritually, church. See, from time to time, God will call people. From time to time, God will call us. From time to time, God will call you. From time to time, God will call me. From time to time, God will call people this morning. Church, he calls people, first of all, to be saved. Acts 17, verse 30. And the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. God is calling every person who is not right with him to get right with him. God is calling every person who is not saved to be saved this morning. Amen. God is calling men. He's calling women. He's calling you whether you you think you're too young. You listen to me, young man, young woman. If you're not young enough to get high, you're not young enough to die. No, oh, I'm too young. I'm too young, but yet you're smoking weed. I'm too young. I'm too young, but yet you're getting drunk. God calls you to be saved. But also God calls you to do something for him. The call of God this morning is when God speaks to you in regards to his will for you and your work for him. In verse one of our text, 
God called Jonah and he gives him a task. He gives him a, an assignment in verse 1 and verse 2. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to cry out against that city. Here is God. He is calling this man in verse 1 and in verse 2. But in verse 3 of our text, Jonah dropped the call. Listen, church, we can do this both with salvation and we can do it both with service. We can drop the call on God. We can say no to God. Listen, if we're in a bad space in our lives, when God calls us, if we're not close to the tower, I like what Solomon says in Proverbs 18, 10, when he says the name of the Lord is a strong what? Tower in which the righteous run in and they are safe. We see that even though Jonah this morning is close or Jonah this morning is called in the presence of our strong tower God, he's far away. Because church, he's not close to the tower. And when you're not close to the tower, you're always going to give God poor service. I wonder this morning, have you ever called somebody this morning on your phone and you get the message, the number you've called is not recognized. Please try again. That is so vexating. That is so irritating. Now, hey, you're trying to speak to somebody and you get the message, the number you've called is not available. Please try again. Now, imagine this morning, imagine God calls somebody to do something and God gets that response. The number you've called is not recognized. Please try again. And you know that's their number. You know you haven't dialed wrong. You haven't missed any digits. You know that's exactly who that person you're calling. Church, God has to deal with this all the time. I wonder this morning, how many drop calls has God had to deal with, with us? Here he is, church, he calls us. And some of the conversations and some of the calls, you can say, have left us excited, amen, left us, amen, we're filled with life, left us filled, oh God, you would use my life, oh, this is going to be powerful, We could, this is what's hap happened, this house is going to take place, oh God, and there's an excitement, amen, because God has called us, some of the calls this morning has left us, amen, feeling that it's been a bit demanding, it's been a bit too much, maybe I'm not able to do this, some of the calls have left us convinced. Amen. I'm pricked in our spirit. Some of the call this morning have left us humble this morning. And maybe we've cried. Maybe we've come to the altar and we've fallen on our faces and we've made vows and promises to God. We have spoken words to God. Maybe we've actually shared it with our, our spouse or shared it with our friends or shared it with our pastor and said, oh God, dealt with me about something. And I've, I'm moved and I'm, I'm touched by it. But church, what happens is the problem is we drop the call because we don't do it i'll say for you this morning amen you just went on with your life church that's a drop call and i'm saying that to say this morning church there is something of jonah in all of us i don't like this guy you know very much but there's something in jonah in every single one of us so let's consider the questions this morning. Now, here's the good news. God hasn't changed his mind about what he wants you to do something about. And I'm sure this morning the situation is still a need. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. That's chapter 3. Now, a lot has happened between chapter 1 and chapter 3. A lot has happened before he receives the second chance. A lot has happened before he receives the second opportunity. A lot has happened before he receives the second call, which has not changed. God didn't change his mind. It's all right, Jonah, I understand. If you carry reading, he says, I want you to go to Nineveh. Cry out to that city, Jonah. I ain't changed my mind about this. I'm not going to tell you to go to, I don't know what, uh, next door, their neighbors, Assyria, next door. Uh, no, 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 but with, no, no, I want you to go back to that same place. The Bible says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Church, God doesn't change his mind very often. So the question this morning is, will you pick up what you've dropped? 
We need to ask ourselves some questions. Very, very important questions. Then we're going to pray. I'm going to give you six questions every single one of us need to ask ourselves this morning. So here's the first question. Are you using excuses or escapes regarding your call? Are you using excuses or escapes regarding your call? You see, when God calls us to do something, we even make excuses why we can't do it or we run away from it, whatever your it is. We make excuses why we can't do it. Moses said he stutter. God, you can't use me. Jeremiah says, but God, I'm just a young man. I'm just a teenager. You surely can't use me. Gideon says, I'm the least in my father's house. We say things like, God, I'm not qualified. God, you, you know my struggles. You, God, have you been to my house? God, have you seen my marriage? God, there's no, God, there's no way you could. We say, we say things like, well, pray is not my gift. We bring all matter of foolishness before God. And what we're doing is we're trying to excuse ourselves from what God wants us to do. You see, what I, what, here's the thing about Jonah. Jonah not so much makes excuses this morning. Jonah does the other thing. Jonah tries to run away from God. Psalms 139, verse 7 and 8. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there too. We try to run from God. There's some spiritual Usain Bolts in this church. Running. Running from what God would have you to do. Running. And here's the thing this morning. We try to escape. The way we, 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 the way we try to escape is not so much speed. It's more stealth. It's stealth in the sense of God has dealt with us about something. But we come to the house of God. We kind of blend in. Kind of keep low key, then we're gone. Come in, I come to church, I blend in, keep low key, and I'm gone. But I'm not doing what God is telling me to do. I'm here, but I'm here. At least I'm here. God doesn't just want you to be here. God doesn't just want me to be here. Listen, Jonah had his reasons for not wanting to go and do what God would have him to do. But church, I'll tell you right now, just because you have an excuse doesn't mean you have been excused from God this morning. Do you think this morning that God has excused you from the call? God is omniscient. In other words, God knows everything about everything. God knows this morning every excuse in your mind. God knows uh, amen, every escape route you have already set out this morning. There's nothing that God does not know. Listen to me. There's not going to be a time God, you come to God and says, well, this is the reason I can't do what you want me to do. And God says, you know what? I didn't ever thought about that, you know. My day. You're clever. Gabriel, write that down in the heavenly section of point two, five, five. They've told me they can't do it because my day. No, listen, no. That does not exist. But here's what I want you to see this morning, church. Jonah is not actually running from God. Many of us are not running from God. We like the Lord. We love Jesus. Jonah's running from Nineveh. He's running from his assignment. He's running from what God wants him to do. See, we like God. We love Jesus, but we just don't want to do what he wants us to do. Lord, they're being very quiet this morning. My son, that's because it's me. I'm speaking to them. I'm calling them. Okay, Father, I'll continue. Here's the second question. What is your Nineveh? Verse 2, go to Nineveh. Church, we all have a Nineveh. Listen to me. This is how you know what your Nineveh is. 
Your Nineveh is the moment God speaks to you about it, you push back. The moment God deals with you about it, you rebel. What's your Nineveh? Your Nineveh could be a thing. There was a famine in the land. Elijah is told to go to Zarephath. There's a widow there. God says, I've commanded her to give. He gets there. He sees the widow. He goes, listen, uh, can you get me some water to drink? No problem, she says. Oh, by the way, um, while you give me that water, please make me a little bit of cake. Whoa. You don't understand, man of God. I'm a widow. I have one son. We're going to eat this food. I'm going to die. You, you don't, what you're asking is too much. And when I read that, it wouldn't blow my mind. They're in a famine. In a famine, the most important thing in a famine is water. She has no problem giving him water. Not a problem at all. What your problem is or what your issue is not my issue. What, 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 what your struggle is, is not my struggle. She has absolutely no problem giving him water, but she has a problem giving him some food or some cake to eat so he can eat. And here he is, uh, the moment amen, Elijah brings it up, there's a whoa! No. Or it could be a person. I want you to think about this. There are some people in our lives in which God wants us to be right towards and our attitude is I'll rather suffer the consequences of my disobedience than speak to her. I'll rather suffer the consequence of my disobedience than speak to him. In the words of Pastor Alvin Smith, there it is. That's your Nineveh. Right there. Here is a man, church, he's fleeing when he should be following. Listen to me, your Nineveh, if you follow it, if you obey it, is uncomfortable. Nineveh was a mad place. Nineveh, they were a sadistic society. They had a king that when they, when they, when they caught the enemies, they were cut off their lips. They cut off their hands. When you came to Nineveh, the city, there was a mountain of skulls. People's skulls, they have killed and they have defeated just there. Just mountain of skulls. What a welcoming. You know, I remember when I went to Guyana and I went to some places, there's this, there's this big sign, welcome to Guyana, welcome uh, to Jamaica, welcome to this. There's this big skulls, mountain skulls, welcome to Nineveh. Just there. Who wants to go to Nineveh? Nineveh is known in those places where you're, 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 you're in a service or a conference and you say, God, send me. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Nineveh is not, sir. No, not interested. Forget that. Me, Nineveh, mm -mm. we ain't doing this. You're mad. Lord, I'll do anything but that. It was a horrible, it was a wicked, uh, uh, it was a wicked society. Listen, church, no, Jonah had an Nineveh, and you do too. And the truth is, many times we are more interested in our comfort than our commitment towards the things of God. I want to go to Nineveh. So he pays for a ticket, and he goes to Tarshish. Tarshish is Spain. Where Spain is, is the Mediterranean. It's up to today, beautiful. People are still going to holiday in Tarshish. People are still getting on a plane and a boat, and they're going to Tarshish still today. It is a place of the weather is nice, uh, the, the palm trees and the food and the atmosphere. It is a wonderful, wonderful place this morning. You know what I've learned about the devil this morning, church? Uh? The devil will make sure that there is a way to get out of the will of God this morning. He will make sure this morning there is a way for you to get out of what God wants you to do. That brings me to the third question this morning. What is your Tarshish? Because if Nineveh is the place I'm running from, then Tarshish is the place I'm running to when I don't want to obey God. What is your Tarshish? See, not only does Tarshish take me away from your assignment, 
Tasha is going to take you away from God. Second Timothy chapter four, verse 10, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed to Festus and Lycan. Enough words, enough a beautiful place. I don't want no commitment to the things of God. I want comfortability. I want ease. I want everything running perfect for my life. Paul, you are on your own. Verse three of our text, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Tarshish is the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. Tarshish is the place we go to when we want to comfort ourselves, when we don't want to be committed to what God wants us to do. Now, the truth is, church, you and I, we can literally never get away from the presence of God. It's, it's impossible. There's nowhere you can go to to get away from the presence of God. You can go to IB for as nasty as it is, you can go away from the presence of God. There's no way, zero, no way you can go to, no way I can go to. We found that in Psalms 139. If I, if I go to hell, ascend to heaven, if I go to hell, God, you are there. But here's the thing this morning, church, spiritually you can. Because when I'm not seeking God, when I'm not pursuing God, when my priority is not to please God, I am literally making myself distance miles away from God. Because I'm only thinking about myself. I'm only thinking to please me. And church, when you and I are not close to the tower, you are going to give poor service. And what's going to happen time after time after time, the cord is going to be dropped. Time after time after time, as God deals with us, we're going to drop that cord. If you read verse four, a storm comes from nowhere. And in verse five, we find the sailors, the sailors on the boat, they're trying to get rid of the cargo uh, on the boat. Because whenever a storm is taking place, you want to lighten the load of the ship in order to help you maneuver uh, the difficulties uh, of that ride, you can say. So here they are, they're trying to get rid of the cargo of the boat because they realize their lives are more important than things. Listen to me, church, they respected the storm so much. These men made some adjustments. This brings me to my fourth question this morning. What needs to go? Because whenever you are in a God-ordained storm, it is an opportunity to move things from your life that are not fitting for where God wants you to take you to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 Paul writes to the churches, for all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Church, some things this morning uh, may not be sinful, uh, but they are not beneficial. They will not build you. They are going to end up breaking you. I've really been... Um, fascinated if i'm honest this morning about all the madness that's taking place with our good friend p diddy really been fascinated and what's sad about this what's sad about this because like our kelly he was warned i remember when our kelly said i don't want to do this anymore and a very nice man called kurt franklin says continue now kurt franklin is our jail, our fairly, he's probably going to die in jail. But before that, God had warned him. That's why he says, I don't want to do this. In other words, I don't want to be doing all the bump and grind, all that nastiness anymore. We're done. All that nasty albums, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. I want to focus on gospel. I want to give myself to church. Curve. No, 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 no. He's in jail now. Puff was the same way. Do you know that? He was warned. A man of God, a, a preacher, who none of you would have ever heard of, warned him three years ago, before this kicked off, warned him, saying, God has put you in my heart that if you don't stop your nastiness, it's over for you in a horrible way. Warned him, would not listen. 
And now, you know, it's all out there, what, whatever has happened, et cetera, and so forth. There's, there's just all talk about, um, um, you know, the, 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 they say there's, there's two uh, DD parties. There's the, there's the DD parties where everybody kind of goes to and everybody like Tom, Dick and Harry wants to, ca want to come in because there's celebrities in there. And there's one called DD After Dark. It's true. They say one is PG and one is X-rated. That's what they say. That's right. And you know, again, what, what, what's caught my eyes is that there's so, it's amazing, just before this take place, do you know how many preachers, well-known preachers, have stepped down? I don't know, have you noticed? If I start throwing names to you, you're going to get nervous. Some of you know that. They step down. And one of the most prominent one, I've heard he has, but again, I'm not too sure, you know, that who, was, who seemed to be always making a frequent visit to Didi's party was a man called T.G. Jakes. You know what I've learned a long, long time ago? And it's, I'm even more reinforced now. There's some places I don't go to anymore. It's not evil for me going there. Right? It's not evil. It's not, the Bible says thou shalt not go to those places. But I've learned something. I'm not going to allow my, my, my liberty in Christ to, to I'm, I'm not going to allow the liberty I have in Christ to give me a license to do what I want to do. Somebody, I'm just, I'm just going to go to it. I get invited to stuff, family stuff, friend stuff. They're not evil. They're not sin. But me and I go. I'm just gonna go there. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be a testimony, be light in the darkness. No, you go, you're gonna <laughs> hmm. <laughs> no, not interested. Me now go even more now than ever before. If you put yourself in certain places, it's not gonna benefit you, it's gonna end up breaking you. You carry on reading the story. This storm happens. These men begin to throw their cargo off the ship. Listen, church, because they respected the storm. Now, I'm not saying all this Diddy thing and all that to, to kind of make you laugh, but here's, the, here's, the, here's my point in the whole Diddy and R. Kelly thing. Do you respect the storm? They began to get rid of stuff because my life is more important than things. Do you respect the storm this morning? Or do you need to be reminded? In verse 5 as well, we find everyone is praying. These are hardened sailors. They are praying. You know what I've learned as well, church? There are some crises this morning in life that nobody's an atheist. I've been around staunch atheists. I, again, I'll never forget September the 11th, staunch atheists. The moment they began to send people home, there's this guy, I mean, uh, 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 Brandon, I remember him, this short guy, glasses, staunch, full of pride. No, I'm not gonna, I have to pray, let's pray. You're an atheist. Pray to who? Everyone's praying. Verse five says, Jonah is fast asleep. There's two things I want you to see here, church. Things must be really bad when everybody's praying but the Christian. But here's the other thing this morning. We think the right decisions bring peace. That you got a decision to make and you're kind of tormented, you're perplexed, and you, you make the right decision. Like, You know what Jonah teaches us this morning, church? Jonah teaches us that you can have, you could be at peace in your disobedience. Because when you read the account this morning, so you know, sometimes you, you wonder people, you know, someone makes a decision and you wonder, how can they sleep at night? Very well. Jonah's not tossing, he's not turning. He says, okay, God, I'll do it. Okay, you convicted me. Oh, God, you're right. No, no, no. He is seeing. He, in fact, when you study the word, the, by his sleep, it's almost, he, he, it's a dead sleep. That's what the Bible says. It's like the sleep of death, as in you're, you, nothing is disturbing him. There's a storm happening. The whole boat is tossing. The man is out cold. 
People are about to die. The man is out cold. Lives, innocent lives are going to be lost. The man is out cold. Listen, church, we are supposed to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And sadly, much of the church is sleeping. They find Jonah. They cast lots. It falls on Jonah. Listen, church, when you're a Christian and there's a crisis, people are going to look for you. In verse 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, and he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rolled hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more temperate against the them. Here are men who are more righteous than the man of God. They did not cancel Jonah, even though Jonah canceled Nineveh. They said, we're going to try and save this man. We're going to do what we can to rescue this man. But the Bible says, but the storm, I mean, got worse. They're trying to do everything they can to make things right, but it's not working. And the reason being is because Jonah's heart was not right. This brings me to my fifth question, church. Who needs to go? Verse 12. For I know that this tempest, this storm, is because of me. Jonah is connecting the dots. Some people need to learn to connect the dots. Guys, can we do that later, please? Let's do that later. Yeah. Some people need to learn to connect the dots. He's looking at what's happening. After the men have spoken to him, after the lot has been cast out, and he picks it up, it's, it's just random things. He picks it up and he, he draws the shortest one and it's, it, 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 it dawns him like, oh my days. It's me. This thing is happening because of me. They tried to save him. Have you ever asked yourself this question, why is this happening to me? You know what I realized when the story is Jonah? God is maybe after someone you're carrying and we're making excuses for them. Who has to go? No, I've learned after 23 years of being a pastor that you can't build the church on some people. You just simply can't. Something I try to speak to my pioneer guys about wherever I am. That there's some people this morning, church, that you simply cannot build the church on them. They contribute nothing. I love what Pastor Mitchell says. Uh, he says they are spiritual leeches. <coughs> Never give. Just take, 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 take. And as a pastor, your desire is to hold on to people and to keep some people. But they, listen to me, there's some people this morning whose hearts are not right and they have no plan for it to be right as well. Jonah's heart is not right. Because if this man's heart was right, he would have said, listen, guys, uh, just take me back. Just take me to Nineveh and I'm just going to do the will of God. No, 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 no. This man says, I want you to take me and throw me overboard into the sea and what this man is saying is i'll rather die than to do what god was told me to do you can say listen let's, let's head towards Nineveh. no no from of sea church sometimes like the sailor we are caught in the middle of god dealing with somebody else somebody close to us and the reason our life is going this way and that way is because of them. In verse 15, the storm stops literally immediately when he's thrown overboard. 
and in verse 16, the Bible says, Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They are praying to their idols. Nothing is happening. They get rid of Jonah. The storm stops. They connect the dots. Idols, no good. God of Israel, good. And to cut a long story short, these men get saved. This morning, maybe you're here. Who's stopping you from getting saved? Who's stopping you from getting your heart right with God? Because they need to go. And lastly, what's robbing you of rest? Herod the sealers, they're struggling. Jonah's in the deck of the sea, sort of the ship, and he's cool. They're struggling. He's in the deck. He's cool. They take him, they throw him overboard. Now they are cool. But Jonah's struggling. We can be in church and we're wrestling with God about something. Wrestling with God about issues, wrestling with God uh, uh, about maybe what he would have us to do. I don't know this morning, but we could be in the house of God and we're meant to, we're hearing from God and there's, there is a wrestling, there is a back and forth, you could say, that is taking place. And I've realized something, when you wrestle this morning, you can wrestle with God to the point where now you repent, but also now you can recover what God wants you to do for him. That's what the wrestling is all about. I remember sitting down in a conference many years ago and I was wrestling with God. Then I repented. Then I said, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I've been in many services where I've wrestled with God and I've repented. I said, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. So I want to closely look at what needs to happen. In verse 10, these sailors ask Jonah a question. Why have you done this? Let me put it another way this morning. Why are you going in the wrong direction? Why are you sailing away from God? Because this morning, church, God doesn't want you to sail away from him. God wants you to sail with him. God wants you to move with him. And the question this morning is, what are you going to do about it? Jonah, sorry, yeah, Jonah chapter 3, verse 6. I want to read this. I'm going to pray, pray. He's received the call the second time. He's going to Nineveh. He's done what God wants him to do. And in Jonah chapter 3, verse 6, I want you to read what this Bible says here. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and ashes and sat on the ashes. Here's the king. Here's the man who runs things. Jonah has preached. He's heard about the preaching of Jonah. He gets off his throne. Puts off sackcloth and ashes. This is a picture of repentance. And he's in that place. And if you know what happens after that, he begins to come on everybody. Everyone needs to repent now. You know, I read this morning to say this church, we need to get off the throne. See, too many of the people of God are occupying the throne of their lives. We may say that he's God with our words, but in our actions, he's not. And it's so important we get off the throne. And we need Jesus to get on the throne of our lives. We need to be dethroned this morning. Think about it, church. When he obeyed, the result was unprecedented revival. Revival like I've not seen. In fact, the only revival that's going to top this has not happened yet. 
The Bible promises a last day's revival. This revival is so powerful. The king is repented. The people are repented. The dogs are repented. The cows, the animals, they put sacrifice ashes on them. Everybody, every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the dogness can repenting. And the only one's going to top this is the last day's revival. This is on. This is never. This is this. This is this is blow your mind stuff. When this man obeyed God, in this morning, church, God is calling us, and it's so important, church. We should not. We dare not drop the call. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. This morning. I believe the greatest call of God is what is about to happen right now. It is the call to salvation. It is the call to repentance. It is the call to give our life to Jesus Christ. Without this call, all the other ones are non and void. Without this call, all the other ones really will not make a difference. Without this call, all the other ones will not happen. It cannot happen. And this morning, I believe men and women who are not saved, God is calling you. He's calling you to turn from your sins and put your faith in Him. He's calling you to get off the throne of your life and your decisions your heart and let him take his rightful place whether you're young whether you're old whether you believe or you don't believe whether you're sure or not sure God is calling you don't drop the call don't put off for today God is dealing with you about today. Under the sound of my voice, say, Pastor, I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. There is sin in my life. And this morning, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm away from God. I have no assurance that when I die, heaven will be my own. I need Jesus. I need to be saved. That's you this morning. God is speaking to you. Will you do one thing? Just lift your hand up and put it down this morning. I'm praying for you. In this building, unsaved. Or maybe you're a backslider and you once had a relationship with God. Or listen to me, Jonah. God is calling you again. I so thank God for a second call, a second opportunity. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And this morning, backslider, God has given you another opportunity to get your heart right. Do not leave this building without Jesus. Could you imagine if Jonah had said no again? Don't say no again. Answer the call. Don't drop it. If that's you, you're backslidden and you want to recommit your life. Would you do one thing? Just lift your hand up and put it down. Just when I want to pray for you quickly. Up and down. You're not right with God. Or you're backsliding. You once had a relationship with God. And for whatever reason this morning, I talked about dropping uh, who has to go. There's somebody in your life that's keeping you from Christ. Keeping you from committing yourself. Keeping you from following him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. This morning, the Spirit of God is speaking to you. That's you. Come and lift your hand up. Here's my hand. I want to pray. Here's my hand, I want to get saved. Here's my hand, I want to recommit my life. Put it up and put it down this morning quickly. Amen. Amen. Then I want to speak to the people of God. I want you to think about Billy Graham. Think about the impact this man made. Unprecedented. How God has used him unprecedented what God did for his life and we can only speculate we can only imagine if Chuck Templeton and 
Ron Clifford. We can only speculate what would have happened if they didn't drop the call. So many times we look at what one person is doing and say, wow. And we think that somehow that allows us to not do anything because somebody's got it covered. It actually breaks my heart because we are minimizing impact. I thank God for what Billy Graham did. But if these two men had not dropped the call, who knows how the world would be today? If they simply just stayed on course. See, the truth is we can be cool in our disobedience. We can be having a good time, not moved by external circumstances. But once we're in deep waters, once we've been swallowed up by some big things, I've seen this happen so many times. There are many women here, you better start connecting the dots. There was a long period of time before Jonah is thrown overboard. And God is gracious to us. He gives us that period of grace. But there comes a time where he's going to make sure he has a fish with your name on it. And in Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. He cried. He finally does what's right. But look where he's in at. There are many women here God is calling you. He's calling you to preach the gospel, my brother. He's calling you to pray, my sister. He's calling you and I to obey him. There are specific things he highlights in our life, in our spirit. Don't drop the call. He calls us to give. He calls us to open our mouth and witness to people. He calls us to make peace and not war. Don't drop the call. Don't drop the call. Don't shake off what God has dealt with you about. And now you've justified all the reasons why and you want to run or you want to make excuses. Don't drop the call. this morning the altar is open let's come and meet with God this morning maybe God has reminded you of something you've buried you buried in your soul 